Hey, good morning. I'm Jim Moore. This is Words of Encouragement. So glad that you uh, tuned in today. I've got a lot to speak, uh, I believe, from the Lord in your heart today. It's my pleasure to do so. And I um, want to just bring you some hope today for your future and uh, what God has planned for you. I know the plans that I have for you, say the Lord, says the Lord, plans to bless you, prosper you, give you an intended end. God has an intended end for you. I think one of the the bedrocks of uh, our faith is the fact of knowing that God's got good things in front of us. He's got good things in store for us if we'll walk in alignment with him. God bless you, Annette. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, I think I see Dean's little circle picture up there. <laughs> I do this on my phone, and so uh, the people that show up are little tiny circles way up here at the top. And uh, sometimes it's hard. Yep, that's Dean. Bless you, Dean. God bless you. God bless you. So glad to have you guys uh, with me this morning. Trust that God is uh, waking you, as the scripture says. He waketh morning by morning. Uh, one, of the, one of the wonderful, annoying things about the Lord for me personally is that he awakes me every morning. Uh, years and years ago, I just I had a, a moment uh, where I asked the Lord for for, uh, you know, that he would wake me up every day, that that would just be that scripture. And he does. And sometimes he wakes me up <laughs> when I don't want him to wake me up. <laughs> so middle of the night or uh, whatever, you know, the Lord will. Um, yeah. So anyway, last night was one of those nights. But anyway, God is good. Amen. And um, he's got good plans in store for us today. So I'm going to draw you a little closer here. Um, I want to talk out of two passages of the scripture. Tiffany, hey, God bless you. Uh, you know, we live in such, um, you know, just really, really crazy times right now. And, you know, it's, it's okay. It's okay. God chose you to live in these times. This is not an accident. Sometimes we get to wondering if we're doing anything of any value and um, <clears throat> if we're really, if we're making an impact. And that's one of the biggest things. I want to talk to you, if I were to entitle this today, actually, it's not if I were, I did. <laughs> I want to talk about training. Okay, now that may not feel like that appeals to you or that applies to you necessarily, but I think you might find out that it does. So, um, uh, two uh, portions uh, today, if you have your Bible with you or if you're able to do it on your phone. Hey, there's mom. Bless you, mom. Hope you're feeling good. Um, and that's Psalm number 42 and Ephesians chapter 5. So I'm going to give you a bite out of the Old Testament and a bite out of the New Testament. And, uh, and I think they cover quite a bit of ground. Now, when it comes to training uh, with the Lord, and again, every Christian needs training. But the kind of training we need sometimes is different than I think the concepts of the world, and sometimes the church laps over in the worldly concepts and vice versa, and sometimes that's good. Sometimes some of, you know, the world has some ideas that we need to grab a hold of, and vice versa. Um, but I do think that sometimes we tend to develop, kind of, it kind of evolves, I know we don't like that word, but it kind of evolves into more and more almost kind of um, natural thinking, you know, the, the natural man knows not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. We must remember that uh, that Christians are on a different plane. Uh, and the reason I say that is because the tendency is to gravitate more and more toward, towards earthly wisdom and so on and so on. So anyway, so what I want to say from the very beginning is that I do not believe that um, standard, typical biblical training and stuff like that is is wrong or bad. So first thing out of the shoot, I want to say that because I'm going to say some things that might sound like that's true, uh, but it's not. I think we just need to keep perspective. And again, for I just want to say if you're watching this, you're watching it because, you know, hopefully the Holy Spirit prompts you to. And often, again, we don't feel, I want to talk to the common person. I'm not talking about the theologian or the guy or gal, <coughs> excuse me, that's, um, that's trying to train for the pastorate or to be a missionary or something. That's not, I'm talking about everyday Christians who want to be used for the Lord. And, you know, I don't think I've ever met a true believer that doesn't really want to be used for the Lord. So we're going to take a look at these passages, and um, and I think they're going to speak to your heart. So can we pray? I, I, know, I normally do that at the end, but I don't just feel like praying. Let's do that. So, Lord, we just thank you for your word today. And, Jesus, we're not here just to... 
go through the motions. <clears throat> we need the spirit of wisdom and revelation. I pray it for myself. Spirit of wisdom and revelation. I pray it for those who are watching. Lord, because we really do want to be impacted by you right here, right now. We're not looking to be entertained, <clears throat> but we want to be impacted. So Lord, open our ears, open our eyes. Help us to hear something we haven't heard before that will shift us into a place we've never been before. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you say amen to that? All right, so look at Psalm number 42. Again, talking about training. I want you to have some hope <clears throat> for your own future. Um, I want to start out by giving a saying that I've said many hundreds of times uh, at the House of Prayer and different places that I preached, um, you know, various places. Okay, are you ready for this? Because this is super important. This to me is like the bedrock of the bedrock. All right, here it is. Are you ready? You might want to write it down. What you do for God will never be as important as who you are for God. Okay, now actually, let me, let me rephrase that. I didn't say that right. I'm sorry, I got sidetracked. Let me say that again. You, okay, here's how it goes. Here's the saying. I got it backwards. All right, I made a mistake. Right out of the chute, I made a mistake. Yay, hallelujah. I'm not perfect, once again. Okay, here's how it goes. Scratch that last one. Here's how it goes. You, starts out you, Y-O-U. You will always be more important to God than what you do for him. I'm going to say it again. You will always be more important to God than what you do for him. Why is this important? Because we have to remember that true north, ground zero, bedrock foundation is you and him. Everything that you bring to any other person comes out of you and him. When you and him goes by the sideline or becomes secondary or, yeah, I know that, but it's not quite as important, you lose, okay? This is what Jesus said, the great commandment, right? Love the Lord your God. I know we know we, we get all quoted. That's part of the problem. We get it up here. It's not so much in here. But in the very end, when people come to the Lord and they say, yeah, but we prophesied and we did this, I don't know you. How is that? How can that? How can that be possible that people can do spiritual, supernatural, miraculous things and not know the Lord? Well, they lost sight of because relationship is intentional. So you, I'm going to say it again, repetition, right? That's how we learn. You will always, always be more important to God than what you do for him. Okay, so that's... That's ground zero. That is ground zero. And you know what? That will protect your heart. You know, because there's going to be times every person, even Jesus, including the Lord, every minister of the gospel, every housewife, every baker, every student, it does not matter what your station in life is right now. Please understand that. Every single person, you have times where you're successful and the crowds are looking. And, uh, you know, this is one of the things about Facebook. It, it kind of naturally gears you to want to come up with creative ideas to get more people to say, you know, to hit the like button. OK, that is so deadly to the soul because this is not about how many people like you. Jesus had massive followings. Paul, massive. All the apostles, all the disciples, all the Old Testament saints, they had seasons where everybody was looking at them and everybody was. You know, but you know what? And then the, all of a sudden they were all gone. <laughs> you know, what happens when you get old and retire and you don't have 5,000 people looking at you anymore? What happens to your heart then when your whole life has been about what you do instead of you and him? And that, it's not just saying, yeah, I know that. It's really developing that understanding without casting off the other. Okay, so you, I'm going to say one more time, you... Okay, tattoo it on your eyeballs. You know, you will always be more important to God than what you do for him. And I'm going to go on to say what you do for him is an outflow of that first principle. And I'm not just talking about being right with God. <clears throat> okay, I'm not just talking about living holy, although I am a big believer in living holy. I believe that. I preach that. You know, I think much of the mess we're in today is because we decide that it's okay to sin. <laughs> it's all right. No big deal. No, it really is. It's, it's, it's bad. That's why Jesus went to the cross. Okay. Anyway, that's not my message. When you lose sight of the fact that you are more important to him than what you do for him, then what you do for him starts to become your God. And you can only give 
who you are and what you are. Okay, you can only, your whatever ministry it is. I know for some people, I'm actually, I'm thinking about my mom right now, bless her heart. Her ministry is prayer. She's, she's at home. She has her place where she prays and she cries out to God for different, and that's not, well, that's all I can do. And that's kind of, well, I'm not, you know. So we have uh, Sean Foyt coming in a couple days. Big guy. God's got a stamp on him right now. He's doing great things for the kingdom. I don't want to be Sean Foyt. I do not. Okay. There was a time in my life as a young man where lots, and like lots of people, I suppose, I had these visions of grandeur. I was going to shake kingdoms and blah, blah. And you know what? There's, gosh, you know, and nothing wrong with wanting to shake the world. But sometimes we want those things because we get value out of them. And we need to get our value from the fact that I am walking with God every day. I get to be in a room with God. And that's not a fantasy. That's not a fairy tale. He, I am here in this room with Jesus right now and talking to you. I got a chair set right there. You don't see it. And I know people think that's crazy, but I don't think it's crazy that we believe what we say we believe. I think it's crazy when you say you believe something and you don't really act like you do. Okay, so anyway, we get to be with him. We get to be close to him. Okay, Psalm 42. There's If there were two passages <clears throat> that I would give to you for training... Let's say this is training day right here, right now, okay? So you know somebody that wants to be used for God. I'm about to give it to you right here. There's a couple foundational things. I'm going to give you an Old Testament. I'm going to give you a New Testament, okay? I'm going to give you the Old Testament first. It's Psalm chapter 42. Now, I'm going to highlight verse number seven, but really it's the whole chapter. And uh, I'm not suggesting that um, you memorize. I mean, yeah, that's that's awesome. I'm not very good at memorization. Anybody else out there? I have a hard time memorizing. I especially have a hard time knowing where to find it. I thank God for, you know, it used to be strong uh, concordance. Anybody remember the big green giant book that you could kill an elephant with? Uh, <clears throat> and then <clears throat> now we have Google. Google has replaced uh, Strong's Concordance for me. All I have to do is punch in a part of the scripture and I can find it, which is glorious. Okay, so I, I rely on those things. So I'm not saying that you have to memorize or anything like that. But this is a chapter <clears throat> that comes out of the beating heart of David. Don't want to go into David too deep, but remember, he, he becomes kind of an Old Testament picture of what God is looking for. Okay, don't erase that. Don't go, that's Old Testament. I hope you're still not in that frame of mind that nothing matters. Actually, they do matter. Actually, the Bible says that the things that they went through were written for our examples upon whom the end of the world are come. Let's not get rid of those things. But David, it's, the Lord said, here's a man after my own heart. He's going to build his kingdom. We call the kingdom of David, the Messiah. I mean, he's a guy that epitomized what God was looking for. <clears throat> now, David, his ministry, you want to talk about ministry, he was a king, okay? I mean, you talk, you talk about him, and this, he's, he's way up there. I mean, he is actually a priest. Maybe you don't know this. Some of you don't, might not know this. He actually was a, pr a prophet, priest, and a king. Really, he was. He was a prophet. David prophesied many, many things about the Messiah. He was, by all definitions, a prophet. He didn't write a book like Isaiah, but he was definitely a prophet. He was a priest. He wore the linen he fought. He literally acted in the place of a priest. And he was also a king. And in this way, he typifies Jesus and he typifies you and I, what God looks for us. He says, you may all prophesy. Boom. Okay, there's the prophet part. Uh, not that you're a prophet, but you can prophesy. And, and the priesthood, the priesthood of the believers. We're all called to be priests. We are called to stand in between God and man. We go to God on behalf of man and we go to man on behalf of God. We speak and we talk about the Lord. We preach the gospel. We share what we are, feel God's heart is for people. So we go to man on behalf of God. This is what a priest does. And we go to God on behalf of man. That's intercession. That's pray. Jesus is a great intercessor. Okay, and kings, the Bible says you're a king. And, and I know some of us, we just can't grasp that. You need to. You need to. You are a king. In the future, okay, Jesus, he says, the vast number of people, okay, I have it on good authority. You look in the, in the, in the book of Revelation, you see all these people. We love the scripture, right? 
I don't mean to make my eyes big all the time, sorry. We love the scripture that says that, uh, you know, he, he saves people out of every tribe and nation, right? We all love that. We love that passage. Okay, what is that saying? That's talking about you. You are of a some tribe somewhere, okay? You're the American tribe or the, I don't know what you are. You're part of the tribe, okay? Every tribe, every nation, every family, every ethnicity, you name it, every people group, singing a song, you have made us to become two things. What are they? Somebody tell me what they are. Priests and kings. If you have not grappled with the idea that you are a priest and a king, you need to stop and do that and ask the Lord, give me a revelation of that part of you, that you say I am that I really don't get. Okay? So it's good. All right. So so David was all those things. And, and the reason that David is such a great example is, and the Lord said it, I have found David to be a man what? Who, he really lived holy. No. I have found David, well, to be a man, says, says the Lord, he's so smart. He's really, really smart. No. Mm -mm. Well, I found a David to be a man who just, he's just a really good king. And boy, he really, uh, yeah. you know, those things might all be true, but that is not what the Lord said. What was the foundational thing that God said about David that pleased him so much? That made him the prototype, as it were, of what a believer is supposed to look like and what the kingdom is supposed to look like. And really, Jesus was like David and David was like Jesus. What did he say? I found David to be a man who is after. What does after mean to you? That means he's in pursuit. See, it's not about just a whole bunch of religious ideas that are in our head. You're pursuing something all the time, whether you realize it or not. You are pursuing something all the time, whether you realize it or not. And we get to choose. Sometimes we just pursue stuff because life demands it of us. Well, you've got to do this. You've got to do that. And there's nothing left over. Okay? The reason that God liked David so much, he said, he is, I have found him to be a man after in pursuit of my own heart. Now, what does that mean? That means more than ministry. That means more. We're talking about training. The foundation for your training is your heart relationship. And I know it circles back around to that, and I know we all know that, and blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> but I found David to be a man after my own heart. So let's read. I'm not going to read the whole Psalm number 42, but let me just read the first verse, and then I'll skip down to verse number 7, because it's really all kind of the same theme. He says, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. I'll read verse 2. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When will I come and appear before my God? This is the cry of a lovesick man. And for so many of us, again, it's difficult to relate being lovesick. That song of songs language. And again, pitch for my book. You need to get the book. I'm telling you, you need to get it. Okay. And if you've gotten it and it's ministering to you, you need to tell somebody about it. Anyway, so he's saying, this is not, this is not religious language. This is not David saying what he knows he ought to be like, or this is the cry. What happens when your heart really gets to the place where you're not satisfied? You know how this typically happens is you encounter the Lord. You get in church, you are in your car listening to a you know worship song, whatever, and the Spirit of the Lord comes on you. I've had this happen hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands, I don't know about times, and I love it. It's my lifeblood. It's who I was made to be. You know, some of you know my past. I was pursuing sin. I was after uh, evil, you know, because it was fun. And, be, you know, there is some joy. There, The Bible calls it the pleasures of sin for a season. I, I enjoyed, you know, what I was pursuing. But it left me feeling rotten and empty and tired and really wanting to die. And then he came. He came at the right moment. You know, I didn't start out thinking that I was going to be a preacher. And I, I feel like this is for somebody right now. I did not start out thinking I was going to be a preacher. I do believe I was designed to be that, but I didn't start out feeling that way. I, I was just, I was just happy to be saved. I was just happy to know I didn't have to be a slave to sin. And when Jesus came and encountered me those first few times, I was overwhelmed because I knew it was him. I knew it was God. You know, I knew it wasn't just my emotions, you know. And that's one of the ways that 
that, and then that goes down to verse number seven, deep calls to deep. He's the one who's calling us. He's the one that sets up scenarios so that we'll know he's there and so that we'll know he's speaking to us and that he's calling. Deep calls to deep. What does that mean? That means God is deep and he's calling to you. You are deeper than you think. You may be living shallow right now, but there is this thing in your heart just like David that says, I have to go deeper. I have to know. So you get that encounter in church or maybe when you first got saved or whatever, and that's calling. That's not just God saying, hey, I love you and everything's cool between you and me. No, it's, it's an invitation. It's supposed to engender desire and hunger in your heart. And that's, this is the foundation of training for the kingdom. You got to love him. People who are sitting on the right hand of God a thousand years from now are not people that just were, did really good and they were just good people and they lived holy and they didn't sin a lot and, uh, and they were saved by the blood of the Lamb. No, the people that sit on the throne are people that love God. They learn to love Him. So, I didn't start out being a preacher, but I remember the encounter that propelled me into that. <clears throat> I, I don't talk about it a lot, but I was actually, I'll just give you a 30 second testimony here. <clears throat> I was... Um, a uh, young man out of high school, had just gotten saved, just overwhelmed with the reality of the heavenly realm and how God had opened my eyes. And, and some of you who are watching right now remember those days. And, you know, it was, it was like being born again. What a, what a deal. It was like being born again, right? I did. I felt born again. Everything was bright. I mean, it was. And the reason why, and again, I, I, I won't go into this deeply, but the idea was I didn't just go, well, I'm going to try God. Everybody says God's really cool. No, I came to a point of death. I came to a point where I was done living life for myself. And this is the, the thing that so many Christians uh, don't understand. This is not about getting a new religion, getting a new idea, getting a new way of life. Yeah, I mean, it is about some of those things, but it's really Jesus said, if you come after me, you got to deny yourself, take up your cross. I, I somehow, by the grace of God, was able to do that. So anyway, <coughs> I'm a young man. I'm saved. My dad, my earthly dad, asked. Uh, he gave a job. He had an odd job to do. Dad was building houses, and and uh, it was mowing the lawn. Okay, <laughs> you know. So we have these big ideals, these visions of grandeur. How this, but you can be doing anything. You could be standing washing dishes today, driving in your car, whatever. I am. I was literally mowing the lawn. I am out there as a 18 year old, you know, guy that just got saved, you know, dwelling on the wonder of how I can't believe my good luck, you know, my good fortune. And I'm out there pushing the lawnmower. And suddenly the Lord falls upon me and begins, and it wasn't really specific words, but he just begins to tell me about the ministry. And uh, I had no concept of that. I didn't know. I mean, I thought, my first thought, literally, when, when I was, you know, he was, I'm mowing this lawn, and he's talking to me about how I can, I can preach as my lifetime occupation. There was no concept in my mind that he would call me to do that, you see. But when he first did that, I, I remember thinking, you mean you could do this for a living? You mean, I, that, that doesn't even seem right to me. You know, I thought to myself, it doesn't even seem right to me. I mean, I could, I because I was having fun telling people about the Lord. I was just enjoying, you know, my ability, you know. And I'm a young man. I'm sitting there right now. I'm looking at three guy, three of very young people walking down the road, and their their destiny. Oh my gosh, their destiny. Anyway, so that is when God converted my heart to understand that I might uh, do something, you know, uh, for Him. Now. That started my training process, okay? And I said at the beginning of this program, this is not so much to tell you you shouldn't do classical training, that you shouldn't go to Bible college, all that. But over the years, the mindset of the Christian, and I just want to introduce an idea to you before we go into Ephesians, the mindset of the Christian is that you have to do all those things if you're going to be used for God, and it's not true. It's not true. Deep calls unto deep. Okay, from the noise of your water spouts. Now, let's look at Ephesians real quick. Give me about five more minutes and I'll end up here. <clears throat> My wife says I need to watch the time more. Amen. <laughs> I have a lot to say. All right, God bless you. So, Ephesians chapter 5. Now, the reason I think that um, the Lord put on my heart Ephesians chapter 5 is because it really does give more of the practical. And there's a lot, the whole Bible. I mean, the whole Bible <clears throat> is your training book. And there's no cutting corners for that. 
you want to be used by God, you're going to have to grapple with and deal with the idea that there's a couple things you're going to have to do. And as long as it's it's still about, you know, what I want, then we're not even there yet. It asks really about being used by God and being trained to be used for the kingdom. Is It starts out with this idea of Jesus in the garden saying, not my will, but yours be done. <clears throat> so Ephesians chapter 5, it uh uh, again, so much, but the very first verse says, therefore, be imitators of God. Now, in the practical, should I go to Bible school? <clears throat> you can. You absolutely can if you feel led to do that. That is not, hear me now, a prerequisite for being used by God. It's absolutely not a prerequisite. I want to introduce an idea to you, okay, that I think is really important. Nowhere in the New Testament does it say you have to go to Bible college? Okay, I believe in it. I've had my share of it. I've done some of it. Okay, but here's what I need you to understand. That's something that we developed along the way. Yes, you need to have a grasp of the Bible. Yes, you need to. I think training has really replaced a lot of the classic Bible education. Why? Because what you really need to do is to replicate Jesus to people. You need to we use the word represent. What does represent mean? Represent. Uh, so I just got a letter from a friend yesterday. It was really cool. I'm not going to give any names, but this friend of mine, uh, now this is going to just kind of wipe you out. I know it is. God can use anyone. Remember, he used Balaam's donkey. And this guy's a lovely, lovely man. He's a lovely soul, loves the Lord. But his past left him with some issues that he has to deal with in his mind, mentally. Okay. Uh, drugs, uh, the occult, uh, you know, those things can have a ongoing, long-lasting physical effect on you. And yes, he's prayed his whole life and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, he winds up having to go to uh, a mental hospital for a couple days, okay, to kind of get his mind right, to get some help, you know, and so on, so on. No condemnation, okay? He's a good man who loves God. Now, you would might think, Okay, hang out with me here for a second. You might think that in a situation like that, there's no way he is going to be used by God to do anything because he's in a rough spot, right? Wrong. So he writes me this letter about what happens to him. And I hope he's watching today. I just want to give it an admiration to him. He goes in and he's in the middle of his own crisis, okay? This is another thing. The enemy's always telling you, well, I got to get my stuff together. Well, you know what? You're going to spend in your whole life getting your stuff together. I, I don't want to minimize, you know, if you're in rank bondage and you're, yes, yes, we get that. But you're always, see, I've seen Christians spend their whole life trying to get fixed. Their whole life. And they keep thinking it's just around the corner. It's just around the corner. And they're waiting for this magic moment. Listen, human beings, <laughs> human beings are complicated and they're, they have issues, and we've been launched into a, a culture and a society that is so, I mean, we've got so much stuff, and you've got issues that come from your, but I mean, ad infinitum. I'm not even sure what that means. I think it means just going on and on and on. Anyway, you're, there's always going to be something. So this guy's in, in this uh, psych ward for a couple of days, and he gets, you know, he gets, he gets his stuff worked out, but while he's there, he comes down and he sits down next to a young lady. You know why? Because he doesn't, he is so in love with Jesus, Jesus leaks out of him. He has Psalm 42, okay? He loves the Lord. He is, he is lovesick for God because of the way God has done for him and how he's delivered him. So this young lady is sitting over in a corner. She's a teenager, I think about 18. She's over there. She is crying. She's weeping. She's in the fetal position, curled up on the floor. You know, nobody can get near her. She won't let anybody close to her. She's demonized, actually. And without fear, he just goes and he sits down next to her. And he just begins to just very silently pray over her and just speak very quiet things. He's the only one that she would let near him. Why? Because he came in the spirit of Christ. And he just began to uh, say some things over her. You are awesome. God loves you so much. You know, as the Lord leads him. And she doesn't. Now, other times she was manifesting when other people were doing. She didn't do that for him. And over the course of time, it took some time, took some patience. He actually was able, after a long season of singing over her and just praying, to be able to very quietly 
take authority over the enemy and say, you know, every spirit that might be bothering this woman. And she just calmed down and she just, her whole demeanor changed. And he said by a few hours later, this woman, this young lady was up. She was smiling. Now he said the, the, the difference was so dramatic, you couldn't even believe it. Darkness to light. Happy, smiling, talking to people, approachable. And when he went to leave, I think it was the next day, she came up to him and looked him in the eyes and said, thank you so much. Now, what did he do? Did he use his Bible training? And uh, again, I don't want to diminish those things. What he did, like I said, we use the word represent. The word to represent the Lord means to represent. He actually was able to come to her and say, and, and be Jesus to her in that moment. Okay, now he could have done the whole bravado, I'm the name of Jesus. You know? And sometimes that's what we need to do. But here's the deal. He was able to be Jesus to her, not just talk about. You see, we need to do, we need to be able to do more. Training, training. You know what your training is? Your training is intimacy. Ultimately, no matter what you do, from a pulpit preacher, you know, uh, to a guy washing dishes at a local uh, restaurant, whatever it is you do, you're called to represent Jesus. And you can do that. He made that. He put all the cookies on the bottom shelf. Anyone can do that. So higher education, absolutely, if that's what God's calling you to do. But at the foundation, don't let the enemy use that to tell you you can't do this because you can. He's made a way. He, here's what he said. He says, I know what I'll do. I'll live inside of them. He lives inside of you. And being near the Lord and intimacy, the primary point of your training is intimacy. And really just having a desire when, when you leave your house every morning, you know, to say, Lord, help me. Help me to be cognizant of the people who need to be touched so that I can touch them in the name of Jesus. And never losing that because you're who you are, okay, it's always going to be more important. Or let me say it right. I'll say it one more time and I'll stop right here. You, you, everybody say me, you will always be more important to God than what you do for God. As a matter of fact, what you do for God is going to flow out of that connection. All right, so training 101, intimacy. Training 102, how to minister, how to represent Jesus to people. So let's pray. Jesus, I thank you so much for my friends who are listening today. I just ask you to encourage your hearts today. Help them to know that you love them. And no matter what they're going through, it's not too big that they cannot be used for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys. Um, I accidentally put way more scripture. Somebody asked me yesterday. They don't know how to get to the links. It's pretty simple. When you first open, when you go to Facebook and you go to my page, and you first open up and you see my you know, old man face here looking at you. Uh, at the top, there are some scriptures that are there. There's the title. It says Words of Encouragement Day. I think this is 105. If You have to touch that. You have to take your finger and tap that. 90% of you know that, but for those of you who don't, if you don't touch that, it won't open up to where you can see the rest of the stuff. <clears throat> Typically at the bottom of the text portion of that is where the link is. And so um, there's actually quite a bit because I wound up putting half of Ephesians. You, you really need to read Ephesians chapter 5. It's wonderful. But uh, the link is down at the bottom. And uh, I think the link today that I put on there was again just for the event that's happening in a couple days. Um, I know we tend to say this a lot, but I really think what's about to happen in Salem uh, in the next couple days is profound and profoundly important. If you have a plan to do something, cancel it, okay? Unless it's life or death, cancel it and come to that. And don't be afraid. Yes, there'll be people social distancing. Yes, there'll be people who aren't, just like in any outdoor gathering that's happening right now. Uh, you do according to your comfort level, but I just want to encourage you, uh, if you want to witness history, if you want to witness history, boots on the ground, not just watching it through a television screen, if there's any way, come. And I know some of you can't. But uh, anyway, God bless you. Love you. Uh, I just pray God's blessing upon you today and uh, just ask that the Lord increase your understanding of him and your wisdom and knowledge. And uh, sorry about that. I uh, I think it, all right, there we go. Sorry. When people try to uh, to call me or something during this program, I get it on the screen and it messes me up. So anyway, God bless you guys. Love you. Give yourself permission to have a great day.